So I'm introducing uh, Dr. Beverly Jacobs uh, of the Mohawk Nation of the uh, Honden Zones uh, Confederacy, the Bear Clan. She was recently appointed as a senior advisor to the President on Indigenous Relations and Outreach at the University of Windsor. And she uh, is practicing law part-time at her home community of Six Nations at the Grand River Territory. Beverly? Give her a warm hand. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Skano Sokwego, Giaso Gwenkiuse, Ganyangehaga Nyagwai Shoutna, Hodanashoni. Greetings of peace uh, to you. I told you my, my nation is the Mohawk Nation, my clan is Bear Clan, and my real name is Gwenkiuse, and it means she's visiting. And I live uh, in my community. Uh, Six Nations, Grand River Territory, and uh, which is part of the bigger Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So thank you to uh, the organizers. Thank you for the invitation to come and, and, uh, and chair this important panel. Um, I have been uh, uh, honored uh, to, to be in, in uh, different spaces. Um, I would say from the time that I was born uh, to understand the impacts of, of genocide. Uh, I was born and raised in my community, uh, raised in ceremony uh, with our traditional uh, ceremonies and uh, with our, our leadership, our chiefs and our clan mothers and our faith keepers. And um, so I grew up with that kind of, uh, I would say empowerment um, this, the, the knowledge that was provided to me growing up. Uh, I actually didn't realize how much I was taught until I went to law school. And when I realized at that point that uh, law was used as a tool to uh, commit genocide against our people, it was legalized genocide. Um, you know, I felt uh, privileged, um, not even knowing how much others were not given that, that kind of upbringing, um, not realizing how difficult it is for, for those who were not raised with it, um, and then to, you know, to come back to, to who we are as, uh, um, as Ongwahome people in our, in our language. As, uh, as first peoples, as people from, from the land, from our territory. And so, um, you know, it, it's been through my own life experiences and the life experiences that I've had to insert that into my education and to have that kind of uh, awareness. Um, I'm just gonna share one story and then I'll introduce it. The, the speakers, because this is, this is relevant to, you know, within these institutions and how colonial they are and how we've been, as Indigenous people, put, in, put into these spaces as well. Um, so when I was doing my master's in law, because I was able to focus on Haudenosaunee law and that it is our international law, um, that I, when I was doing my, my work and and when I say that I've been privileged, that I've had access to our knowledge holders, just because of, you know, my family and being raised in my family and them seeing me at ceremony and having access to, to those knowledge keepers and knowledge holders, um, that it was such a, it was such a um, painful, it was traumatizing to learn how law was used as a tool and so when I was working on my master's in law, it was um, uh, easy, really easy to talk about Haudenosaunee legal orders and Haudenosaunee laws. And, um, and then when I started talking about the impacts of colonization at that time, and now more stronger, the impacts of genocide, 
when I was speaking in a cohort of, of my, my colleagues, I started, as soon as I mentioned the word, the impacts of colonization, this was the very first time in 1994, um, that I, I cried. It was like, a, it was like one of those, um, those painful tears, painful, um, it's even hard to describe because it's such a deep uh, emotion about the impacts of, of genocide and what it's done to our people because I've experienced it, I saw it, I seen it from the time my grandmother, uh, growing up with my grandmother who was in the residential school in the Mohawk Institute and and so it was, um, that's when I became aware of the trauma, not just of me, but of my family, of my nation, of my clan, of my, of the whole, whole confederacy. And then so it's taken from that point to probably in the last maybe five or so years to realize how strong we are the resiliency of our people and the strength of our people to now come to this point where we are now telling you how it is. That they, they were not successful. That we are, we are now uh, what I call victorious. We're not just survivors, we're not victims, we're, we're victorious. We're the winners out of this war, um, but we're still in it we're still in battle, we're still at war. And, uh, and so that's part of, part of what I see happening through these kinds of events of, um, you know, educating people about the truth and about the realities of, uh, of who we are. So I, I wanted to share that because I think it's important and there's so much in my experience that um, the impacts upon uh, even specifically upon women and uh, and how women have been the targets uh, of uh, of genocide uh, so you erase the women you erase nationhood right you take away our babies you take away our roles and responsibilities as mothers as clan mothers you take away our nationhood and so that was a, that was a big uh, principle for me when I became president of the Native Women's Association of Canada and said, even to our own men, to our own leaders in our communities, you know what our laws are. You know that women are the backbone in our communities. And this is the realities of, of what's occurring to Indigenous women. So not only missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and the, the high numbers, the crisis that we're at, we're at a national, international crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And when you talk specifically about erasing women and targeting women, that's, that's one of many issues, one of many. And so another one is uh, the topic today is, is forced sterilization, coerced sterilization. So again, you take away our body parts, you take away our, our, our bodies and our relation, even the relationship of the land to our mother, the earth and the rapes and everything that's happening to her is the same. And so, um, you know, again, it's one of many issues, and I appreciate you know this, the, the amount of knowledge here, uh, in these 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 few days that we have together to you know have these like minds to come together and to to speak the truth. Um, because sometimes it's hard for us when we're when we speak the truth because then we come, become the targets. And, uh, and so we need the support from everyone when, when we become the targets. Um, so again, just, just wanting to share that. Um, okay, Don. <laughs> Where is it? Just introduce my name, you know me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't, think, I don't think they wanna know as much as I know about Don. <laughs> 
<laughs> We've been friends for, I don't know, like in our 20s. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Dawn Martin-Hill. Um, and she is a powerhouse Mohawk uh, activist, scholar. Um, her and I get into big trouble at home. We're from the same community at, at Six Nations, Grand River Territory, because you know, we speak the truth sometimes gets us into trouble because we're not afraid to. And Dawn is not afraid to. And Dawn is not afraid to um, say what needs to be said. And she has the, uh, what I call, and what we've called the two-eyed seeing, right? Being able to see from our indigenous perspective and, and the roots of who we are and using academia uh, as, as uh, as a voice as well to bring attention to the issues in this space. So I, uh, I, I introduce her, she's Mohawk, she's a strong Mohawk woman, Turtle Clan. Um, wolf. Oh, Wolf Clan, oh, oops. Uh, wolf <laughs> Clan. Um, yeah, so there you go, Don. <laughs> Okay. Hi. So, yes, I'm going to, you're going to, are you leaving me? Oh, no. <laughs> Don't. Right here. This one? Just don't leave me. Okay. Hi. Um, you wouldn't know that I um, do a lot with technology in my research, because I don't know how to do anything, but I have computer engineers who do. So. Um, very, very valuable service. Thank you. <laughs> so part of what I want to talk about briefly is like uh, Dr. Karen Stote, my colleagues on my grant, um, I have three on water, and um, it's an interdisciplinary grant. Um, as an anthropologist, it, I know it don't make sense, but most of, most of my life doesn't make sense, so it's all good. Bev understands me. Um, so I do a lot of things that are in a plural space, as she mentioned, and I um, pull many different disciplines together, and we tackle issues together. So that's, and we end up doing, listening to whatever the clan mothers basically tell me to do. And they're usually very challenging. They're usually things that I just go home and like cry, and then shake it off and go, okay, yeah, I can make a virtual reality, no problem. Um, and then go find the people who know how to do that because they want our stories to be told. Um, so, so women's law is something that came from faith keepers in the community. They wanted to go get the Hewitt Collection, which is an Onondaga. Our languages are on the extinction list. There's very few Onondaga speakers. So I took a bunch of them to uh, the Smithsonian, and we went into the archives. They pulled what they wanted, and I pulled the women's law, uh, uterine, uterine law, because <laughs> what is that? Um, so I pull most of the information that I'm presenting to you from peer-reviewed publications. These are scholarly journals, books, chapters. Um, nothing I'm saying isn't uh, been peer-reviewed by other people, and as well, Bev and I have published a few things together. Um, one of my first publications was a book on the Lubicon Cree of Northern Alberta who happened to be head over the head with the tar sands. They're a hunting society, didn't have a road into their community until 1980, and they are now suffering severe consequences and genocidal acts, which has been recognized by the United Nations. So I've been looking at environmental ways in which the government attacks indigenous people. Karen Stote is the... Um, uh, uh, person who wrote an amazing book and did archival research on sterilization of women in Canada. She brought all the receipts, she got all the data, there's nothing in there that's speculation. Um, she is not here today, she's unwell and on leave, so I'm trying to cover what I was originally going to cover, which is more ecocide, um, but also talk about the very important work of Dr. Stout, who I'm in deep admiration of. So part of what I do um, as an anthropologist is trying to look at what is indigenous ways of knowing, knowledge. I try to bring ancient systems into modern settings in science and develop ways to solve real problems like sterilization of our women. 
Um, so part of that was looking at the woman chief, which was recorded in 1907. Um, it was a, a chief, Gibson, who, who um, was going over the great law. And then Nora Carrier, one of the last Onondaga fluent speakers in our community, along with a number of other speakers, vetted and translated. And this is what they translated. We do enact that the place where in the chieftainship of benign power lie and trust every one of the clans, which extends to every one of our several lands of tribes, that the woman who holds them in trust, the chieftainships of benign power, shall be for every uterine family the eldest woman in it. In fact or in fiction legal, she shall be the eldest woman. This, that is, shall then continue to be so to her, the eldest woman, then the eyes of all persons of her uterine family shall be turned for guidance and counsel. He's talking about clan mothers. The men of every clan and of the five nations shall have a council fire ever burning in readiness for the council of the clan when it seems necessary for the interest of the people for the council to be held in the to, for the council to be held to discuss the welfare of the clan like the wolves take care of wolves business and she's bear they take care of the bears um, but they're all Mohawk so so they're all meeting as families and this is what he's reciting in the great law um, when it seems necessary for the interest of the people for the council to be held discuss the welfare of the clan then the men may gather about the fire. The council shall have the same rights as the council of women, meaning we had power. We always had power. Just remember, this is about a thousand year old constitution of the Haudenosaunee people. So this is the law of our land as far as I'm concerned. So up from 95, the council fires of the women of every clan have the same rights as the council of the men. The great law predates democracy and women's rights by over 900 years. This is a fact, there's a number of scholarly articles based on archeology span evidence, astronomy, because they describe you know, that there were um, different things happening with, with the stars. So we've kind of nailed it down to you know, just over 900 years. So at the same time that our people are talking about how to create peace within nations and how women uh, chief have this, this power, um, it holds and trusts the land. So it's arguing and it's saying in there, by her benign power shall be every uterine family the eldest in which in fact or fiction is her legal authority. So Franklin and all these guys in Pennsylvania, which I'm not gonna go over, there's tons of literature on it. They were hanging out with our sachems long ago. It's well documented in Grindy and a number of other. In fact, they designed the American Constitution after the Great Law of Peace. They used our symbols. And our guys were saying, you guys have 13 colonies. That's really problematic. Why don't you unite? And unfortunately, they did. Um, so <laughs> we didn't tell the guys to go tell them, OK? So I'm just saying this was when patriarchy started to seep into our world and into our world view. So Gibson elaborates that no one chief governed as a people but an ember of bloodline and the uterine matrilineal had several leaders and 49 at the same time the great laws established. So there's not just one Mohawk chief, there's I think nine, as well as clan mothers and then faith keepers of which Bev is one. So we had a number of ways in which we articulated women's power in particular to steward the land. They were the proprietors of the land. They decided what was gonna happen on the land according to this earlier rendition of the great law. So she's bringing this role, as he says, it is the responsibility hold and trust the lands and waters of her clan, bringing the role of the duty burden and to work with her eldest warrior who is to assist her in her duty. So he's already calling women warriors. He's always saying you have this burden to carry for the people, to care for the land. That's my little warrior, um, Akasha. She's gonna get mad when she finds out I'll put her in here. <laughs> Anyways, the linking of the duties of stewardship to her warrior is implicit that we are protection of. So in this way, Harvey Longboat, who founded Indigenous Studies and was a mentor of mine, and, and I hold a lot of, of respect for, for that title and, and for those that hold his title now, who I work with, um, in this statement, they're sharing the responsibility. So we don't talk about things in terms of rights. Um, and Bev made this clear to me in legal terms. It's about our responsibilities, not rights. 
And that's where we diverge from the United Nations and the way that they look at things. So Gaji Cook, who's a midwife who happened to birth that young woman you just saw up there and a few of my others, um, because I, you have to have your own children. I can't have them in a hospital because they'll take them away and we'll get into that. So the women are the first environment. This is what's in our law. It's in the Ganyo Hanyo, one of the oldest speeches that our people have in the creation story. So women are, in sense, law. They are the natural law. And the respect for women in the relationship is because she carries life. So she particularly sustains life. Um, to, if you know about microchondrial DNA, if you're into anthropology or biology, you know that you know, we carry both all, both paternal and maternal, all forever going back, and then our children going forward. So we're literally carrying the past in our ovaries, and we're carrying the future. This is not lost to colonizers. So with our bodies, we nourish, sustain, and create connected relationships and interdependence in the way the earth is our mother, in this way the old people have said, as women, we are earth. The foundation of Haudenosaunee society is the great law of peace, a constitution that's organized our social, political, economic, and philosophical principles, and this is well documented. I'm not gonna get into how much there is, but if you're interested, I'll give you resources. So women as the first environment are the embodiment of Mother Earth. That is the Haudenosaunee law. From our DNA, we carry both all parties, which then are the matriarchs to uphold the law and our bloodline. So if you now look at what was happening in Europe, um, you have the Pope in 1095 making the first what we would consider racial or racist edifices. Um, and there's a lot of really important literature coming out on this. But this is where the term terra nullis came from before he applied it to the New World. Um, he gave it to kings and the prince of Europe for the right to discover or claim land in non-Christian areas. Um, on paper, it was vacant, terra nullis, but he also took um, liberties with slavery. So they went around the world and created a lot of carnage under this papal bull. So as they moved into the doctrine of discovery, which is a little bit later from that, they applied the papal bull, terra nullis, the land is empty, and that is what current Canadian and American law is based on. It's patriarchal. So I'm not gonna go over all of it because I thought this was two hours and I was panicked for the last two days and it's only one. So I'm gonna hurry up and get through this. Um, so the policy um, under Nicholas um, in 1452 was that he declared war on all non-Christians throughout the world and authorizing the conquest of their nations. The edicts that he put out for uncivilized subhuman and without rights to land or nation is how they were justifiably in their laws uh, able to invade our lands and commit genocide against our people and continue to do so. So just remember these laws were upheld in the United States in Oneida, uh, our people on the Wisconsin side took them to court and our our feminist, Ruth Gator Ginsburg, upheld the doctrine of discovery and ruled in favor of it and said, this is the law of this land. So we have a real different version of feminism, if you will. Um, as same for the Canadian side, our elder spoke about it last night in the film. You have the Dalga McMarshall McLuhan. Um, there's a number of ways in which they've upheld it. So this is the foundational of genocide in this country. Now, if we go into current times and we argue about how many indigenous people were there, um, there's a number of really good articles coming out by anthropologists and archeologists, and this is even on Truth and Reconciliation's website. So this isn't Dawn being radical like it was 20 years ago, this is Dawn being validated because even the government has to admit, yeah, we don't know where all the bodies are buried and we don't know how to begin looking at this issue in terms of a Holocaust because a Holocaust term came up uh, during the World War I and II. You have this predating the Holocaust, so we've kind of been left out of the genocide discussion, but I'm not so sure that's necessarily a bad thing because we're sovereign peoples and we will determine how we want to represent this history, um, and I think it's more than sterilization, more than genocide. Um, if we look into how the, the numbers uh, uh, that are going over, even the great dying 
um, that a recent archaeologist put together, we have varying numbers. So I don't want to get into the number games, but let's say it's between 55 million and 112 million. And this is new studies with old studies, but not what you learned in school, which was Moonies, which was one million. That was to make it not look like genocide, because if we had one million upon contact, 200,000 by 1800s isn't bad. If you had 111 or 172, 155, there's many different numbers. Let's go with the lowest, 55 million, and then you have less than a million in the 1800s, then that is under the definition of anthropology, under the definition of the United Nations, and under the definition of Haudenosaunee law, that is decimation genocide of a people. Okay, we survived genocide. Um, there's some uh, tribes who didn't, the neutral, Peyton, Erie, you should know the tribes here that didn't make it. So we're dealing with now language where we call this an evasion. It's not even really settlers because settlers it, it, it connotates that we're friends. We weren't friends, okay? Um, if we made a treaty, it was out of coercion. It was out of desperation. We just lost half of our people. We lost doctors, leaders. So we were in dur duress when we made treaties. So even looking at treaties, contemporary ones, eh, they're not that great. <laughs> so, and they haven't been kept anyways. So narrating this history is very important to use the proper language is all I'm saying. And the modalities in which we want to talk about this is they have generally, and academia has played 99.9% .9 role in this, controlled this narrative, including my people's history, your people's history, every other person's people's history. And they made it justifiable. They made it look like a natural, oh, diseases wiped us out. We were weak. We were biologically uh, weak people. So that all feeds into their narrative that this was really God's plan that they come here. So we survived this phase, now we go into them taking our children off to, which is ethnic cleansing camps as far as I'm concerned, and we should quit calling them schools, they're not. Um, it's called indigenous, indigenous side. It, it, it's, it was really, really bad what they did. And we haven't even begun to think about what the mothers did when they came and took all the children. And if you didn't give up your child, you went to jail. So you had no choice. The RCMP, those friendly people, that propaganda that's put out to the Americans, these are the people that were created specifically to take away our children and to handle the Indian problem. So yeah, we don't look at them necessarily the same way. So they took over 150,000 children. This isn't in Canada. This is, in fact, in the US. This is Carlisle. Um, if you look at their faces, and you can basically study, if anybody knows or familiar with psychology, you will know that these are all traumatized children. Um, so these children were put into these camps. They were starved, beaten, raped, and so on. It's all documented and it is part of the Holocaust Project of the Americas. Okay, so they closed down the schools for the most part, not all of them, but for a great many because of the resistance of indigenous people. And then they start taking the children through the Canadian Welfare Agency. There are now more children in care in Canada um, in the Child Welfare Agency than there ever was in residential schools. Um, in the 60s, they were adopted out, so my mother fled from my reserve in Canada to Buffalo. Many Iroquois did that, or Haudenosaunee, they're in New York, Detroit, because, interesting enough, uh, the U.S. was a safe place because they didn't have this policy of taking the children, and it was very easy to take our children, it still is. So if you um, didn't have uh, bedrooms for all your children, they could say you're taking... That's one thing, but you never got to get them back. They put them in Kansas, they put them in foreign countries, in Britain, they were basically trafficking our children. And I'll get into that a little bit. So sterilization is going on at this time as well. You had a eugenics movement in 1928 start, and this is Karen's work, which I can't go over the beautiful work that she did. But there was a eugenics committee of Alberta. It was made up of physicians. Um, no, it was British Columbia, sorry, was the first one. And then Alberta put up the second one in 1934. So we had the eugenics movement before you had the eugenic movement in Europe. I'm just saying. They got their ideas from here. In fact, he went and worked in Germany. 
So the eugenic policies they had, I've listed out here, can't go over them, but these were on the books until 1973, so this is not distant history. Um, also, the guy who invented birth control, he tested them out on our people, and they are now pushing this on indigenous women across the country. So the eugenics movement hasn't stopped, it's just rebranded itself. And Karen does this, read her, her book, please, An Act of Genocide. So if we go into the contemporary sterilization, we literally have cases before the United Nations right now in Saskatchewan where women were forcibly sterilized without their consent and the government of Canada said it's okay. You can look it up, Google it. It's like literally common knowledge over there. So you have all of this attack, and, and, and this is taking the children. I, this is one photo that really got to me. If you understand, they have birth alerts. So the CAS, the nurse can call the Child Welfare Agency as you go in to have your baby, and you don't even know when you have that baby, they're going to come and take the baby. And you have no recourse to get your baby back is going to be a long, long journey, and they make money, so it is for profit. So this is all, again, just documented. Um, Canada, under the Trudeau government, said, oh, no more birth alerts. Thank you, Trudeau. The forced removal of children can be understood as a form of torture, and I think what they were doing with the Latin children here in the U.S., we all know that was a form of torture. Um, I call it the earliest form of human trafficking that was state-run, and it's still happening both in the U.S. and Canada. So I'll jump into ecocide. This is where I worked with the Lubicon for some 30 years. I wrote a book about it. These people never had cancer, never had respiratory issues. They were incredibly healthy. And the last time I checked with council, they had 21 stillborn births out of 28 pregnancies. You're only a community of 400 people. That's literally every pregnancy. Um, if you know anything about tar sands, bitumen, and the kind of carcinogens it gets off, it wears down your membrane, which is why you can't carry a baby to term. They're not even trying to stop this. And then I had a student um, do this um, uh, study, and I don't have time to go over it, but she overlaid the missing and murdered indigenous women's map with pipelines. And I said, just see if there's any um, correlation between pipelines and missing and murdered indigenous women hotspots. I couldn't do this a year ago because we didn't have you know, the hotspots, the mapping, and a lot of what I do is mapping. So, so this is a very important seminal piece of work and I hope Kathleen keeps it up. Now we want to do the mining and man camps. Um, to, we think those are the outliers because I can see that's Lubicon up there where that one red dot is north there. I know that's how, that's where I, and I know there's a lot of missing and murdered women. So then if we look at water and the contamination of water, going back to women and uterine law, if you look at the Great Lakes, our people had the largest body of fresh water, one of the largest in the world. Um, if you look at it, this area as a country, it's the third largest economy in the world. That's how important water is. If you look at Canada, you think we have a lot of water. We don't. We're already in a climate crisis because of the tar sands, because of the pipelines. We are now warming twice the rate as the rest of the world. That includes the Arctic, which keeps the temperature down for the rest of the world. It is now melting three times the, the, the global rate. So we're becoming quickly water insecure. And that means food and water insecurity is going to quadruple in the next decade or so, according to all of our studies. This is my community of Six Nations. I'm running three large water projects, looking at everything from midwifery, birthing, to what's in the tap water, and what we're finding is really troubling. And we also know that there's carcinogens in our source water, which is the Grand River, because uh, they were making Agent Orange in the 1960s and dumping it into our Grand River and they didn't really have any rules. And they drudge Six Nations along our reserve very deeply. So it's essentially the dump for the 25 wastewater treatment plants upstream. So this is the water we're drinking and that we have access to. Now remember, we had the largest body of fresh water. So the conflicts our people have had and continue to have, this is me filming at the reclamation, but we've had a few more skirmishes, um, me and Bev. 
we get in trouble. Um, but I do film it because I'm always worried about the Army coming in as they did with Oka. So it's always about land and water, and, and, and people need to wake up to this fact. So sterilization is about controlling the population. Taking away white women's right to have abortion is because we're having three to four times more babies as black, Latino, and Native American, and white women are not having babies. So they're worried because if you're a demographer like I am, you know what's gonna happen in the next 50 years, and the resources are gonna be less and less. So this is Bev, she's gonna be in Vogue. <laughs> and that's my daughter, they're fighting Nestle. Don't buy Nestle. Um, so you should be looking after your aquifers, listening to the clan mothers and uterine law. We don't need to go to do any courts to ask if this is our land and our, our laws. It's asserting, and that's what Bev and I and many uh, indigenous women around the country are doing, is you're asserting the rights you know to be true and you have to take action, such as our midwives training young girls. Like I know for a fact they tried to sterilize me when I had my older children. I know they tried to put me on birth control. They tried to tie my tubes, and they do it when you're in the hospital. You do know that's illegal under the Health Act. You are not to be um, harassed when you're in a state of vulnerability and pain, but that's what they're doing to black, Latino, and indigenous women. So we as women need to be very loud and very clear and asserting that we have matrilineal matriarchal law in this land and we need to assert it because nobody's gonna come and do that for us. Thank you. Now I, down it to him. <laughs> Yeah, very, very powerful. Nyawa, Nyawa Don, thank you.